The image in the New England Journal is shown here. It concerns a one-day-old girl born at 36 weeks gestation, and she has a soft mass protruding from the external genitalia, shown here. Uh, this mass increases in size when she cries. And the question is, what's the diagnosis? And the diagnosis is hydrocolpos, which is a vaginal obstruction that can have several causes. Of the other possibilities that are listed here, I'm pretty certain that this can also happen with the mccusick kaufman syndrome, and we'll have a look at that in a moment. But hydrocolpos has much more common causes, and it's a generalized term for vaginal obstruction in newborns. And the most common cause is imperforate hymen, and uh, there are some diagrammatic pictures of this possibility shown here. Uh, this is associated also with bardet beetle syndrome, but can occur spontaneously and does not necessarily represent severe congenital anomalies, although that may be the case. And this is the mccusick kaufman syndrome. It's an autosomal recessive disease that's caused by disturbances in the MKKS gene, uh, which is important in limb, heart, and reproductive system development. If you count the toes, or actually, the, if you count the toes, you'll see six toes on the left foot and six fingers on the hands. Uh, that's not normal. And these anomalies also occur with the mccusick kaufman syndrome. The first topic at the New England Journal concerns hip fracture. And we're talking about hip fractures in otherwise ambulatory adults. And there is controversy on how these should be handled. One possibility is total hip arthroplasty, where you receive a new femoral head and you also receive a cup for the acetabulum. Uh, this, po this possibility might be associated with additional surgical morbidity probably takes a little more time. The other possible procedure is um, a um, otherwise uh, simple replacement of the femoral head and leaving the acetabulum as it is. The question is which procedure is better and which one gives the patients a better outcome over time. And uh, in this randomized controlled study, uh, Patients were um, with a displaced femoral neck fracture uh, were treated in terms of these two surgical options. So this is a major clinical problem in older adults that fall. And the chances that we're going to get hip fractures in our lifetime is probably around 20%. Udo Fischio, incidentally, at age 81, fell from a streetcar, got a hip fracture, and died because there were no surgical options in 1901. So these patients here were randomized to total hip arthroplasty, which means that the acetabulum is also replaced, uh, compared to hemiarthroplasty, where just the femoral head is replaced. And we see almost uh, 700 and over 700 patients in both of the groups. These are older adults, mean age is 79. Various racial ethnic groups are represented here. Um, body mass index, uh, usually most of these patients are overweight, although not all. And since they're 79, they have other medical problems, but these were distributed similarly in the two groups. And, what we, and the primary endpoint here is um, uh, what needs to be done after the first operation is done. So the primary endpoint was a secondary hip procedure within 24 months of follow-up. Secondary endpoints were death, serious adverse events, hip-related complications, quality of life issues, and these sorts of things. And what we see here, over 700 days of follow-up, is no significant difference. Actually, both groups do very well, and 90% of the people have a pretty good outcome uh, over 700 days since surgery. 
And if we look at details by expanding the ordinate in this particular graphic, it looks like hemiarthroplasty may do a little bit better at the beginning, uh, but then total hip arthroplasty may do some better at the end. So that was the primary endpoint. Now, the risk of a secondary hip procedure at one year was higher numerically in the hip arthroplasty group compared to the hemiarthroplasty group. But in the year following that, these two problems reversed in order, although uh, statistical significance is uh, minimal. Now, serious adverse events are basically not different in the two groups. So in conclusion, both of these surgical options are, are reasonable. Uh, total hip arthroplasty, that means to say acetabulum also replaced, was associated with modestly better function over 24 months, but a slightly higher incidence of serious adverse events although no significance can be attached to these findings. So basically, unplanned secondary hip procedures, 7.9% in the total arthroplasty group, 8.3% in the hemiarthroplasty group, serious adverse events, 41.8 compared to 36.7%, and uh, secondary procedures, about the same in the two groups. So better not fall down. But if you do fall down, it's not a disgrace. Continuing to lie there, on the other hand, is another situation entirely. Now the second topic in the, in the New England Journal is, uh, in English, we call this typhoid fever. This is a bacterial infection by Salmonella, Salmonella typhi. This condition used to recur, occur in massive epidemics and caused almost as many deaths as plague and was a major clinical problem in, up until the beginning of the 20th century, at least in Europe and the United States. Um, the condition is, uh, uh, also associated with a rash, rose spots, and uh, most of the symptoms from typhoid fever or gastrointestinal in, in type and gastrointestinal perforation is fairly common. The condition is uh, spread by contaminated drinking water primarily. And there was a serological test uh, for typhoid fever. This was developed end of the 19th century by uh, George Fernand Vidal, the Vidal test. And what was done in this test is you take serum from the patient, add it to salmonella strains and see whether or not they clump. Of course, it takes seven to 14 days to mount antibodies against salmonella. So this is not an acute test, but it's a classic. And so you might need to know something about it. Now, the a semantic problem is that typhoid fever in the German language, which is called typhus or typhus. And uh, in the English language, typhus is a louse-borne rickettsial disease distinct from typhoid fever. Now, typhus in German is called Fleckfieber or spotted fever. And this Differentiation was particularly a problem in the 19th century. I mean, even William Jenner noticed this and uh, pleaded in 1849 that clinicians should distinguish between spotted fever, typhus, and relapsing fever. The VDA test might help here. Now, uh, fleck fever, or typhus in English, is spread by lice, and lice, incidentally, are insects, uh, not arachnids. And uh, so therefore they have six legs rather than eight. Now, Rocky Mountain spotted fever in the United States is spread by ticks. They have eight legs, so they're arachnids. And uh, this Rocky Mountain spotted fever is actually a form of typhus and is also rickettsial disease.
So much for that. Well, a vaccine for typhoid fever was introduced about 100 years ago, and it's about 50-50 and not very good. Now, typhoid fever is still common, particularly in Nepal and in India, and could a better vaccine be developed? So this study involved a typhoid conjugate vaccine. Now, this is a randomized control trial comparing two vaccines. Now, the control group did not get the old typhus, typhoid fever vaccine, which I think might have been a good idea. Instead, they got a vaccine against meningococci, irrelevant to this study, but therefore the control group at least got something. And this is a conjugate vaccine, which should be effective against various strains. And what we see here, the endpoint here is positive blood cultures for Salmonella typhi. And what we see here is that the vaccine was efficacious compared to meningococcal vaccine against Salmonella typhi. And the vaccine has an efficacy of about 82%, which is better than the, about 50% that we experienced with the old vaccine. So you can see the positive blood cultures here in the TCV group compared to the men A group. And that was statistically significant to the great pleasure of the investigators. And uh, if we look at antibody titers, sort of a rich man's VDI test, uh, they also went up indicating that um, uh, the vaccine ought to be efficacious. Reactogenicity was uh, acceptable. And if we look at serious adverse events, they're trivial. So it looks like this new vaccine is better than the old vaccine, although I wish it would have been compared to the old vaccine instead of the comparison to meningococcal vaccine, but vaccinating against meningococci is also a very good idea. Now, the next topic in the New England Journal is achalasia. And you'll remember that achalasia is a problem of the, esoph of the gastroesophageal sphincter where the muscles do not relax in response to food boli. The resulting disease is a massive distension of the esophagus, which you can see, see on in this plain film. Uh, uh, you'll see here's widening of the mediastinum by this massive esophagus uh, that's shown here with the barium containing or some sort of contrast agent. Now, this condition, in my day was treated with a Heller myotomy, uh, which relieved this obstruction, but was associated with some amount of reflux. Now the Heller myotomy has been much improved and it's now performed endoscopically, which is shown in this diagram. And this is called the Heller myotomy, uh, the laparoscopic Heller myotomy, abbreviated LHM. Now the gastroenterologists want to get on this game too. And so they've developed a perioral endoscopic myotomy, abbreviated POEM, a little tacky. But here's the endoscope uh, performing an endoscopic myotomy compared to the older procedure, which is a little more invasive and a little more beset with complications, costs a little more money and uh, et cetera. You've got the message. So what was done in this group is 241 patients with documented achalasia were assigned to the POEM group and got the endoscope, whereas 121 got laparoscopic Heller myotomies, as shown here. And what we see is a successful outcome, that is alleviation of the achalasia was no different in the two groups. Actually, both groups did very, very well. So POEM could not beat LHM much to the disgruntlement of the poets that were responsible for poem. Now, there is a little bit more reflux with the, Heller, uh, with the poem group compared to the Heller myotomy group, which might be a plus for the Heller myotomy group compared to the poem group. So at two years, both procedures are acceptable. Perhaps the LHM group has a little less reflux than the endoscopically treated group. The third topic in the New England Journal is acute migraine attacks. Now in Germany, acute migraines are treated 
uh, with triptans, which interfere with serotonin signals. Those are the, that's the current treatment of choice. There's a whole host of different preparations. Sumatriptan is the one that I'm familiar with. And if the patient has an aura, or even after the pain has already developed, an acute treatment is about 50% effective in aborting an attack of migraine. Uh, the older treatment that was also around when I was in medical school uh, concerns ergotamines, but they have a lot more problem, problems and side effects than triptans. But we know from numerous previous episodes of Clinical Journal Club that a new target for acute migraine is calcitonin gene-related peptide. This complicated peptide uh, is a very potent vasodilator and may play a role in the mediation of migraine attacks. And we've looked at various studies in chronic migraine, uh, looking at blockers of calcitonin gene-related pep uh, peptide signaling uh, to decrease the migraine episodes. Now, in this particular study, you broke it like a good idea, and you you broke a pant was given at two different doses uh, in patients, about half of these patients had migraine with aura, but migraine can also occur without aura. Uh, where, uh, half the, the patients were randomized to uh, two to one, uh, you broke a pant 50, you broke a pant 100 versus placebo. And what surprises me about this study is that the patients got placebo. Uh, they should have had sumatriptan and uh, been treated with some other active agent to see if the new stuff is better than the old stuff. I would hope that the new stuff would beat placebo, and that's what was tested here. And as you can look at, at <laughs> in this table, it looks like you, you broke a pant, beats placebo, but not by very much. And the more ubrogapant wasn't better than the lower dose of ubrogapant. Uh, so um, placebo actually did pretty well and uh, aborted 40% of the attacks. And ubrogapant did statistically better, but I found the results here underwhelming, but then I'm not a migraine patient. So the most common side effects with ubrogapant were nausea, somnolence, and dry mouth. The investigators quite honestly pointed out that one of the ubrogapant patients got appendicitis, another one had an abortion, a third one got had pericardial effusion, and somebody also had a seizure. But they didn't think that any of these complications were related to ubrogapant, and I would agree. So it looks like after two hours of the dose, um, ubrogapan beats placebo, uh, but I would have rather seen a study comparing ubrogapan to sumatriptan. The next, the review in the New England Journal is also interesting. It's about lay responder care for adults with out of the hospital cardiac arrest and uh, how to resuscitate patients probably should be taught in school um, and indeed, it's the case that uh, ancillary medical personnel do better than physicians in terms of conducting resuscitations in most studies. Now, when I worked in the United States, our hospital required that all the medical personnel carry a chip indicating that they had been educated in CPR and this education had to be renewed every two years to allow you to set foot inside the hospital. Good idea. Uh, that was not the case when I came to Germany, although we tried to teach uh, resuscitation uh, to the hospital personnel as best we could, and actually they were pretty good at it. So this is a review about that. And uh, as you can see here, by the time the ambulance gets there in the United States, it takes 15 minutes. So the bystanders here certainly play a role because after 15 minutes, it's probably already over. So bystander CPR is important, particularly in this frame before the ambulance gets there. 
Now, in the United States, the ambulance uh, uh, has excellently trained emergency medical staff to perform CPR. They're probably better than physicians. In Germany, I think that ambulances are usually still outfitted with physicians, although EMS personnel might be better. So the important points here are lay recognition of cardiac arrest, uh, interventions assisted by the communication center, conducting the cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Let me go back a couple. Uh, I like this drone that's bringing the defibrillator uh, to the site where cardiopulmonary resuscitation is being performed. Automatic external defibrillators, we see these in all the airports. Lay provider education, I think lay people pay more attention uh, than physicians when these instructions are given. And um, the uh, uh, authors of this report are from Toronto and they've given us a map where uh, automated external defibrillators are accessible at noon. So it looks like it's better to have your cardiac arrest in the daytime than it is at night. But at night, there's still a lot of defibrillators available. So conclusions, this is important if we're going to improve outcomes for people that have outside of the hospital cardiac arrest, where I believe the chances of surviving and leaving the hospital subsequently still is around 3%, or perhaps it's a little better than that now. This 24-year-old man got a tennis ball directly on his eye, right eye, and he has this uh, fairly large um, hematoma, uh, pre-retinal hematoma. Uh, he underwent a, a pars plana vitrectomy, and actually his visual outcome in that right eye two months later is actually pretty good but this is a dramatic fundoscopic photograph of this traumatic lesion. We discussed Merkel cell carcinoma last week, which is the second really very malignant skin cancer next to malignant melanoma. Uh, this uh, tumor is not pigmented, but it makes these red sort of papular lesions. This tumor is a, one of the cancers that's initiated by a virus, in this case, polyoma virus. Uh, this woman went amputation of that finger. She had positive lymph nodes. This is an aggressive tumor. The histology is shown here and requires extensive debridement if the patient is supposed to, if the patient is to have a good outcome. And we discussed this patient already last week. This is the 57 year old woman that comes to a dermatologist actually initially receives a diagnosis of lupus erythematosus because of this facial rash. This rash could also be mistaken for rosacea, uh, but it really doesn't look, the, the nose is somewhat enlarged and uh, involvement below the eyes, but this really doesn't look, in my view as a non-dermatologist, like the butterfly rashes of patients that I've seen with lupus erythematosus, and it really doesn't look like rosacea either. This woman has involvement of the hands, which would be unlikely for those two conditions. And she also has this neck involvement that's shown here. And that raises the possibility that it might be something else. And we learn that she's got 42 pack year history and she also um, drinks 10 beers nightly, which I think is pretty sportly. Um, so, she has some cough and undergoes additional imaging studies, and this computed uh, tomogram here shows uh, uh, some opacities that shouldn't be there. And the clinical diagnosis here is dermatomyositis, although she doesn't have any muscle weakness, and her creatine kinase uh, is not really elevated. So this condition is called amyopathic dermatomyositis. This high, this, uh, I think the expression means lots of dermato and not very much myositis. So what's the etiology here? She undergoes PET-CT, has two isolated lesions that are very suspicious. These are biopsied. She has small cell lung cancer and uh, the rash gets much better with intravenous immunoglobulins. Uh, the small cell lung cancer receives the usual treatment for that. 
doesn't have a good outcome. But um, uh, tumors are responsible for about 20% of dermatomyositis cases, and clinicians should know something about this condition. Uh, creat uh, creatine kinase and allylase levels should be measured, although they're not always elevated. Uh, there are uh, autoantibodies against amino acyltransfer uh, RNA in this condition. And I want to draw your attention to these neck findings. This uh, is not the patient that's discussed in this week's New England Journal. This is another patient, but, and this is the patient's back. But uh, the, uh, the distribution of this rash also uh, on the back and also on the neck and also anteriorly, as our patient had it, is called Groton sign, and these patients can have papules on uh, their joint surfaces of their fingers, and these are called Groton's papules, although the patient discussed in this week's New England Journal did not have Groton's papules, and Groton's papules are pathognomonic for dermatomyositis. Now we move to the Lancet, and here's a large study from Utah on e-cigarettes. In English, this is called vaping, taking the vapors. And um, this paper is from Utah, where we have all these very religious Mormons, and I would have thought that life here is still in order. Uh, I think they're not even allowed to drink coffee. Uh, but apparently, Brigham Young didn't say anything about vaping. So apparently there's a lot of vaping going on in Utah, and this is a large clinical series of um, 60 patients with severe lung injury admitted to 13 Utah hospitals with injuries after vaping. And a lot of these patients ended up in intensive care units and some of them died. So here's a map of Utah. Uh, this is Salt Lake City. Here's Ogden and Provo and uh, Colorado and Nevada are adjacent and et cetera. Uh, so here's where the patients are from. So they're from these urban centers in Utah. Um, and uh, what we see here is uh, to enter the hospital with a, with a low uh, arterial oxygen saturation is fairly common with the vaping injuries. And the clinicians, not knowing what this condition is, uh, usually gave up and gave the patients steroids, which most of the patients got. Uh, so um, uh, their clinical outcomes were not all unfavorable. Some of the patients were even discharged, then came back to the hospital with more vaping lung injury. Slow learners, I suppose. Uh, and what we see here is a lot of these vapors uh, were adulterating their um, electronic cig electric cigarettes here with mostly with this awful tetrahydrocannabinol oil and uh, marijuana and other uh, here mixed own vape liquid. Don't know what this guy got. Uh, so uh, this was common in these patients. So it may be that the material that is sold by the manufacturers doesn't cause lung injury, but the patients by giving their own additives are responsible for the lung injury. So vaping is bad, um, so much for that. But there's other, there's an, also a New England Journal paper, paper that I haven't seen in hard print yet. Uh, and this paper is from Illinois and Wisconsin. Now those are also two states in the United States where I would have thought the world is still in order. Uh, but here it's also about vaping injury. And this series is quite similar to the last one, and it involves 53 cases of vaping-induced lung injury. And you can look at the courses of some of these patients. They had to be intubated. They're treated with ECMO. Uh, I can't imagine all of this, putting these patients on extracorporeal oxygen uh, heart-lung machine, basically, and um, dramatic. And if we look at these CTs, it's also an example of how much better CT, uh, these are portable x-rays, so they're bad anyway, uh, but this doesn't look so dramatic on x-ray, but if we look at these CTs, they're certainly dramatic. 
And no wonder that these patients have an oxygen saturation of 50%. And um, uh, the girls are also represented here. They're also into vaping, including in Wisconsin and Illinois. Then there's also this letter to the editor. Uh, this uh, is part of the Utah series. And what these investigators found out in Utah is that these patients, it may be the oil that's used to dissolve this miserable tetrahydrocannabinol uh, that basically causes an oil pulmonary injury. Here's another CT from this person. And uh, basically this concerns this is a letter to the editor involving six vapors uh, that um, got their just rewards from vaping. Uh, so bronchoalveolar lavage showed these lipid-laden macrophages. And I wanted to, these are not from the patients. This was not in this letter. But this is what lipid-laden macrophages stained with oil. Um, uh, what's it called again? Oil red O, that's what they look like. So uh, their bronchoalveolar lavage in these patients showed evidence of lipid-laden macrophages, which is probably related to this adulteration with tetrahydrocannabinol. Now, the next topic at The Lancet has, has to do with ovarian cancer, which is not that common, but unfortunately not that rare. Uh, the problem here is that to recognize ovarian cancer in an early stage is extremely difficult. And there have been screening studies with ultrasound and imaging to try to find ovarian cancer in an early fashion. Uh, and these studies have not been too helpful. Now, ovarian cancer is more common in people that have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations, but that should be identifiable on history. And um, the organiz International Organization of Gynecology has uh, developed a grading scale of how advanced the tumors are. And unfortunately, they're commonly first discovered when distal uh, metastases have also occurred. Now, ovarian cancer is treated with carboplatin and pax uh, paxlitaxel. And in this large study, the patients were randomized to dose dense weekly paxitaxel and three weekly carboplatin uh, to see if it would increase overall survival. And uh, you can look at these regimens here. If you're an expert in this, you'll have to look at this at your, le uh, le at your leisure. A lot of patients, 1,500 patients with ovarian cancer that are randomized to uh, carboplatin plus three weekly pa paxlitaxel compared to carboplatin plus weekly pa paxlitaxel uh, compared to group three got weekly carboplatin plus weekly paxlitaxel. And I don't see much difference here in, ter in terms of progression-free survival in the patients. Now there is a difference in patients that are operated upon early these patients probably had earlier discovery of their cancer compared to patient, patients that first received uh, um, delayed primary, uh, that probably receive chemotherapy first and then undergo delayed primary cytoreductive surgery. But I don't see any difference between these chemotherapeutic regimens. And uh, further details are given in these two tables. And if we look at these forest plots here, I don't see any significant differences there either. So this is still a problem. And uh, the authors, can, although I didn't see any difference, maybe that indicates that weekly dose dense paxlitaxel should no longer be recommended as a component of first line treatment because the more restrictive use of paxlitaxel seem to have uh, the same therapeutic benefit. Isatuximab is an antibody against CD38 receptor, which is expressed on plasma cells. We've discussed this issue in the past, 
And the idea here is that this antibody might help patients with multiple myeloma. You'll recall that um, uh, CD19, CD20 antibodies don't help because plasma cells that make lots of antibody don't express CD19 and CD20. So basically, uh, these patients were randomized to uh, anti-CD8, CD38 receptor uh, plus conventional care or merely conventional care. And there's 150 patients in both groups and the randomization seems to have worked. And the antibody against CD38 receptor seems to give these patients a better outcome. Although overall survival, P is less than 0.06, but who's going to quibble? If we look at this forest plot, the strategy to have an antibody against CD38 receptor seems to help. So I think that this treatment offers patients with advanced multiple myeloma a better option. The next topic involves Janus kinase signaling. I remember when this Janus kinase is called Janus because it's double-headed, like the Roman god that uh, uh, faces in both directions. I remember the investigator that described this kinase uh, was um, a, a retiring modest individual and he referred to it as just another kinase. So it's Jack. And Jack signaling is complicated. This is a tyrosine kinase receptor that then initiates signaling through stat molecules, which then operate as trans, uh, transcription factors to mediate inflammation. And most cytokines, including erythropoietin, uh, involve Jack stat signaling. Now, Jack stat signaling might have some particular benefit in an immunological condition and that includes ankylosing spondylitis. So in this patient, in this randomized control trial, patients received uh, a JAK1 inhibitor uh, compared to placebo, and um, we'll look to see if they had a benefit. So 94 patients got their conventional treatment for ankylosing sp spondylitis, and 93 p p uh, p uh, patients also received the JAK1 inhibitor. And it looks like the randomization worked and the scales and severity and these sorts of things were similar in both groups. And uh, the evidence seems to indicate that uh, inhibiting jack stat signaling in these pa patients with ankylosing spondylitis provides them with a distinct advantage. And actually change from baseline and major improvement look pretty good. So if you've got this awful disease, I think uh, Jack stat and ambition is certainly indicated. Now the review in the Lancet, and I suppose this is sad, but I suppose it's no surprise. Uh, corruption takes place in all aspects of medicine. And it certainly also plays a role in global health, which, involve, which involves lots of, lots of so-called developing countries uh, that are headed by dictatorial governments uh, based largely on bakshish. So this expert in global health uh, conveys us the open secret that global health also involves corruption. And um, I, you'll, if you're into global health, you should read this particular um, uh, report, How Corruption Started and Spread, the different types of corruptions, the involvement of government agencies, labor unions, healthcare delivery systems, etc., and uh, also some evidence how this process could be controlled. And the author has even modeled corruption mathematically and gives evidence on how this condition could be controlled worldwide, and that would be a good idea. We close with this 37-year-old patient that com comes to an emergency room looking like this. His doctor thought he ate too much, but that's not the problem. He doesn't eat enough. Somebody took a history and found out that he had an astrocytoma in childhood that was operated on, and he was treated with bilateral ventriculoperitoneal shunts. And we see this huge fluid collection. <laughs> 
So he received a paracentesis uh, to drain this fluid, thereafter felt much better and his appetite improved. Thank you for your attention. More about these topics next week when Clinical Journal Club continues. <laughs>